was by far the most mentioned author was John Green, and it just brought back to me the fact that he is, uh, you know, the man of letters in the Bigfoot community, and uh, remains so to this day, undisputed. And his style of writing is very, very welcoming. We like to think of ourselves here as sort of a welcoming group that would uh, help anybody uh, down the path to really discover the Bigfoot topic. And uh, John Green is the trailblazer as far as that's concerned. He's very, very readable, and he's a very affable type of person. And as you really pour through his work, what you'll notice is that he takes the subject seriously, but he doesn't take himself very seriously at all. And we'll often talk about how his opinion really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things and approaches it with a lot of humility and uh, good humor as well, which is uh, an example that uh, should be followed, I think, um, when you consider the whole thing. What I'd like to do first is talk just a little bit about John Green uh, from a biographical standpoint. He was born in 1927, and he grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia. And he says that he heard about Sasquatch stories from the time he was a small boy, but he never took them seriously, and he didn't really believe that anybody else did either. Uh, Mark, what was, the, what was the name of the guy that was in Vancouver who kind of coined that Sasquatch phrase. Do you know that name off the top of your head? I think it's J.W. Burns. J.W. Burns, yeah, because this is where a lot of that Sasquatch, big, tall Indian type folklore originated, so it makes sense that the green is from that area. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and so he, he grew up hearing the stories like everybody did in that area, but assuming that they were just campfire tales or fairy tale type stories. When he was... Um, a young man, 1954, he bought the newspaper at Agassiz, and that was uh, the Agassiz Harris, Agassiz Harrison Advance. And in 1955, he wrote his first Sasquatch story, and this is to me really fascinating because it was one of those April Fool's Day type stories about a lady being carried away from the Harrison Hot Springs Hotel. So he meant it completely as a joke, and there's all sorts of historical precedent for that, but it also gives you a sense of his thoughts on the topic at the time. Those would change rather rapidly over the next couple of years because in 1956, one uh, Rene de Hinden would come into John Green's office looking for information about Sasquatch, and John Green remembers being somewhat amused by this visit and also feeling a bit sorry for De Hinden because he didn't think that there was any substance to the stories whatsoever. Little did he know that he would end up spending an awful lot of his life um, tagging along with uh, Rene and their various exploits and places that they were called to. Now, Mark, er early on, like this, what for for one thing, what was De Hinden doing there? He was just like trying to dig up reports. Yes. He, okay. At that point in time, I do not believe he was a Canadian citizen, but he's getting his citizenship. So he was intensely interested in Sasquatch and Bigfoot stories, and evidently, because of the area, uh, he showed up to talk to John Green. He didn't show up initially to talk to Green because he had a reputation as a, a Bigfoot scholar. This was well before he started to amass the reports. This was a sort of a right place, right time sort of meeting between the two. What what did, did does Green say what he thought of uh, De Hinden at that time, other than feeling sorry, <laughs> sorry for him? Oh, I I think um, just beyond that, just sort of amused that somebody would be that interested in the topic because he was carrying over his childhood assumptions about those stories. What's interesting is within a year's time his thoughts would start to change very abruptly because this is kind of a, a cool story that you can actually sort of relate to, I think. The, the village council at Harrison Hot Springs was trying to dis decide what to do with a grant that was being offered to them by the government of British Columbia because it was the 100th birthday coming up of British Columbia. 
and they were offering grants to local communities. So they were thinking, what what can we do with our grant? And somebody uh, who is lost in the, the mists of time came up with the suggestion that they should have a Sasquatch hunt. That they would finance that and publicize it, and that would put Harrison Hot Springs on the map. And just the fact that that was brought up started to change John Green's ideas because what came out in the wake of that decision and that announcement is people started to actually talk about experiences that they were having. And not just people, but people that John Green knew personally. And incidentally, that is sort of the uh, truly the friend of the friend type effect that led John Green into a direct uh, exploration and investigation of the Ruby Creek incident, okay. which blew my mind when I was yeah. reminded of that he was front and center in actually being on site and investigating uh, the claims of the story at uh, Ruby Creek. So Ruby Creek was like his first sort of encounter with... One of his first being, uh, you know, acting in sort of an investigative role. Okay. Along with that, in 1957 he got to know and interview uh, one Albert Osman. Right. Which is pretty pretty interesting. But on the Ruby Creek incident, um, he knew someone who worked with George Chapman, who was the uh, father in that uh, the Chapman Ruby Creek account. And uh, that got him you know, directly to the site. And so he started collecting all the reports that he was starting to hear and as I said, he um, talked to Albert Osman and at first did not buy his story at all, but he was very uh, diligent in trying to vet Osman's story and brought a number of different people in to talk to him. And it was after speaking with someone who um, you know, really evidently had a good uh, uh, detector of um, untruths, shall we say, he... Uh, he felt that with all these people have talked to Osman and they accept his story, even though there's real problems with it, um, there must be some veracity to it. And what he ended up saying later in life about the Osman account is that whether or not Osman was embellishing or you know, inventing huge parts of the plot of his story, the description that he gave of the creature fit. And this was long before any sort of uh, popular Bigfoot picture had been burned into the public consciousness. So it's kind of an interesting way that Green went at that. He said, you know, whatever else you believe about Osman, he described a Bigfoot as we know them today without any coaching on the part of uh, pop culture or something like that. Yeah. Um, he also, and the reports that I've read and the various information says that he had uh, direct correspondence with William Rowe, although it, it does not seem that he sat down and had an interview with Rowe because uh, William Rowe moved, actually, right after um, he had his sighting. So it was not feasible for Green to interview him one-on-one, -on -one, but they corresponded through the mail, and Green famously you know, asked uh, him to take legal action to vouch for himself, which he did. Mm -hmm. And uh, incidentally then, in going back just for a second to the Harrison Hot Springs Bigfoot hunt that they proposed, um, the British Columbia uh, government ended up turning down that idea and the council bought a furnace <laughs> instead. But uh, none of that really matters because those were the events that really propelled John Green into... Uh, an entirely different direction in his life. Let me cut you off real quick. Uh, concerning Roe, I'm looking in my book here because I knew there was something in here that I had found interesting. And and it was a sworn affidavit that William Roe uh, wrote John Green uh, about his encounter. And, and this is slightly off to topic because it's more about Roe than it is about Green. But Green does say in the book, I never did meet Mr. Roe, and I knew very little about him. But in 1969, on our trip across Canada, I met two zoologists in different cities who had corresponded with him concerning his observations of Buffalo. They both considered him to be a well-qualified and reliable student of wildlife. And I know you and I, when we had talked about the William Roe sighting, we referenced the fact that this wasn't some guy that was 
a yokel out there just making up a story about some strange animal he'd seen. This was a very qualified man that was, mm-hmm. you know, had a very unexplainable encounter. Yeah, and that's exactly the type of report that appealed to Green the most because mm-hmm. of the level of detail mm-hmm. and the prolonged um, amount of time that Rowe spent as a witness. And that those were the ones that really excited John Green and uh, kind of quickly moved him from skeptic or, or unbeliever into someone who was really willing to consider the possibility. The thing that I think more than anything tipped him over into the realm of believer, if you want to refer to Green in that way, was the 1958 uh, Jerry Crew footprint find and his subsequent investigation of that. Um, in 1958, after seeing Jerry Crew's picture in a Vancouver newspaper, he decided to go to Bluff Creek. And he took his wife and somebody else. And almost immediately, he and his wife found a footprint. And as you read Green's account in the book uh, Apes Among Us, it truly is as if they pulled up, you know, they got lost, they almost ran into a logging truck, it's all this sort of comedic stuff, and then they finally reach a destination, they get out, and Mrs. Green almost steps in a fresh Sasquatch print. It's, and, it, this is such a great time, too, in history. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's, I mean, you're talking about Jerry Crew, so that's literally when the term Bigfoot was, you know, started being bandied about. And uh, there you've got Green right in the thick of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And once again, I mean, what we're presented with is that, uh, you know, John Green was not just compiling these reports from afar. I mean, he was there at these, you know, ground zero type Bigfoot events. Mm-hmm. And all these connections keep happening. Like in the case of the uh, you know, Jerry Crew and Bluff Creek, he would go on to say, Green would go on to say that one of the most important things that happened during that experience is that he met uh, the taxidermist uh, Bob Titmus. Yeah. He was sort of a forgotten figure in uh, the whole Bluff Creek um, history. And these days it seems somewhat fashionable in sort of modern Bigfoot literature to really trash Bob Titmus and call him into question on just about everything. But uh, he had the full and complete trust of John Green. He would come to really trust in Titmus and his uh, abilities to track and hunt. And Titmus was just a crackerjack guy at finding tracks out in the wilderness, which I think is why some people call him into question, actually. Yeah, and there's I, I know there's all this infighting in the in the Bigfoot world, and it goes back to these original guys because I. I can't remember who it is, and I I hate to say it, but I think it was Byrne that really trashed Titmus. I'm not 100% sure that that's true, but it was one of those original guys. And so you had th- there's this common phrase in big footery, uh, the four horsemen of Sasquatchery, and it would be John Green, Peter Byrne, Grover Krantz, Rene DeHinden, right? Those four. That's the big yeah, four. I believe so. Yeah, and, and well, that totally makes sense what you say because there was no love lost between Byrne and Green and Titmus on one side, and DeHinden as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Byrne really rubbed them all the wrong way. Burns made a lot. <laughs> Byrne made a lot of enemies. He he certainly did. He it's certainly interesting. Did. It's it's interesting. One of my favorite things, one of my favorite aspects of all of this, is that those early days, that the history there between, you know, the the fighting between different Bigfoot researchers and kind of the interplay between them, and then you get into the '70s and you've got Robert W. Morgan come in, and and you can see a lot of this stuff play out in some of the not just the literature, but some of the documentaries that focus on some of these characters because there, there's. Uh, they all played some role in those things. There's the Bigfoot Man or Beast documentary that Robert W. Morgan produced, and that's got an interesting discussion during the film with Rene DeHinden and John Green and Robert W. Morgan arguing about kill, no kill. Mm-hmm. And like it or not, uh, Green was always very pro-kill. And right, uh, right up until 
I mean, I th I think even today, I know there was a point in the in the aughts where people were saying that he wasn't, but I mean, as far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, he is he is quoted as saying, "There's only one way to prove this thing, and that's with the body." And um, so I don't know that that would make him terribly popular today, but it's it's a matter of fact that that's that's his deal. It is. I think does the one way in which people are somewhat embarrassed of John Green, if they are these days, is on his uh, pro kill stance. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that that was sort of the final wedge between him and DeHinden, actually. was uh, That was one of the things that finally uh, caused them to pull apart, which was pretty sad because they had kind of ridden shotgun together on a lot of really important um, investigations. So tell, that, tell me about that then. DeHinden, see, I've always thought DeHinden had to be... He's got to be pro kill. I mean, he talks in that interview about how he's pro kill. Yeah, but he evidently he he worked himself away from that. Really? And, uh, yeah. And, and I want to backtrack to 1959. Yeah, sorry to be derail. Yeah. <laughs> Bob Titmus, you know the um, the whole Bluff Creek Jerry Crew thing. Uh, John Green goes so far as to say that. Meeting Bob Titmus was the most important thing that came out of that experience, which is a rather staggering thing to say because it was really seeing the tracks in Bluff Creek. That was the moment for John Green where he came to a realization that he had to find out what was making these tracks. And he was convinced through some of his field studies that a human being could not make these and the places where they found these tracks, you couldn't take some sort of front-end loader out there or something and just easily plant these tracks. You know, the whole Ray Wallace allegations notwithstanding. It was seeing the tracks and finding um, tracks that looked similar to each other in diverse places. What That was the one thing above everything else that um, sort of locked it in for for Mr. Green that he had to, to find this, you know, get to the bottom of this mystery. Mm -hmm. And so in fall of 1959, Bob Titmus wrote to say that some more really good tracks had been discovered, so uh, Rene DeHinden and John Green went to Bluff Creek. It was during this experience that they were introduced to Ivan Sanderson, which is an, another extremely important uh, personality in that whole world. And it was during this particular trip that the infamous, ill-fated Pacific Northwest ex expedition was hatched. Yeah. And the, the principal players in that were uh, Bob Green, Ivan Sanderson, Rene de Hinden, uh, Bob Titmus, of course, and Tom Slick. Yeah, fun And dude. Tom Slick was the San Antonio millionaire who had money to burn, evidently, and was highly interested in funding and quote-unquote leading expeditions to search for the Yeti in, uh, in and around Everest, and then also became very excited by the reports of Bigfoot in the Pacific Northwest and took well, yeah. it upon himself to or try to organize this group to do a similar search. Right, because, I mean, he's been funding these, these expeditions in Nepal and all this for for ages now looking for the Yeti and then all of a sudden reports of basically the same or at least a very similar type creature start showing up in his own you know hometown basically I mean his his own country and it's mm -hmm. like alright screw this we're going there yeah, right. I mean that's the way I've always read it it's like yeah. turn around 180 let's go back home <laughs> definitely it's a little easier really to mount yeah. an expedition in your own country and I think that's definitely one of the things that was at work there. Um, Green has some great quotes about this because he says from the beginning this was just uh, just a fiasco. In a 2008 interview that I listened to him in, he said this quickly turned into a farce and a fiasco. And in his book he's quoted as saying, the essential problem was we all had different ideas about how we should be hunting it and where. And they just really could not get together on the basics of how they were going to do this. Um, they all wanted to do it, but their methodologies, they just could not agree. And, and Green goes on to say also, 
I believe it's in Apes Among Us and maybe elsewhere, that he says, um, you have to think about it this way. Here's a, here's a group of people who are willing to be bullheaded enough to take all the slings and arrows that go along with saying, in the culture of that time, I'm interested in finding Bigfoot. That worked for them in that regard, but you get a bunch of those type of people together trying to pull in one direction. Mm -hmm. They're still going to be bullheaded. They're still right. going to think their ideas are the best ideas, and right. it just was, it never even really got off the ground. In part because Tom Slick saw himself as the leader of this group, even though he'd had, you know, really nothing uh, comparable to the experience and outdoorsmanship that these other guys had. Um, he made Titmus sort of a field deputy leader, and when things just weren't going anywhere, um, Tom Slick brings in his ringer, Peter Byrne. And so introducing Peter Byrne to the mix in that way is really what set uh, DeHinden and Green and Titmus against him. They just couldn't take his confidence and his uh, just his whole demeanor just rub them all the wrong way. So what ends up happening is that Titmus Green and DeHinden go back to British Columbia still loosely under the Pacific Northwest expedition banner but they really didn't want anything to do with Slick or uh, Burn after that and um, forever after there was this antipathy between those two groups. Those personalities are so big. Yes. Because I mean, uh, DeHinden and, and Burn, I mean Burn's this very dignified kind of, I mean, he's your prototypical, you know, um, he's not British. What is he? Irish? Irish, I believe. He's, but he's very, I mean, he comes across as almost British. I mean, this mm -hmm. regal attitude about him, kind of like, it just reminds you of, a, you know, the type of guy he was, which is like a big game hunting and... You know, out in the woods or out in the jungle, you know, safaris and all, and all this kind of stuff. And then he got DeHinden, who's in like Kokanee beer ads, and mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like cussing everyone out. And yeah. Then you got Dr John Green, who's a little more reserved and very analytical, and it's, it's so interesting. That it is. Early, those are early days of Bigfoot. Yeah. By all accounts, DeHinden could not abide. Peter Byrne. Right. And just for all those reasons that you described, just sort of this pompous attitude and and DeHinden really didn't get along with anyone to begin with. It's sort of a miracle that he and Green were friends for as long as they were. Yeah. But just the uh, it, it just didn't work. It just crashed and burned. Which led to sort of a quiet period, if you will, in uh, all the Bigfoot goings on. They did find tracks in British Columbia, Titmus into Hinden in 1961, but things don't really heat up again until 1965, and that's when Green Mer first met uh, one Roger Patterson, who was working on a Bigfoot book at the time, and uh, Patterson paid a visit to John Green, who by then was getting a reputation as a, a serious Bigfoot researcher, and uh, Patterson wanted to use some of John Green's news articles in his book. And it's my understanding that he did just that. Um, two of the most prominent, of course, being Osman and Rowe. And it's been suggested by maybe even Green himself that this sort of set him in a mindset of thinking about writing his own book because he let Patterson have the Osman and the Rowe stories and then immediately almost regretted it. <laughs> like, I wish I would have hung on to those because they're right. such good stories. Uh, but he gave them to Patterson. And, of course, then in 1967, we have the uh, uh, Patterson and Gimlin obtaining the footage of uh, Bigfoot in Bluff Creek. And another, th again, getting uh, back into John Green and, and researching his life. There he is again among the first group of people to ever watch this film. Mm -hmm. um, it was, uh, let's see, it was his brother-in-law, um, you know, Patterson's brother-in-law, Al D. Atley. It was Roger Patterson, 
uh, Rene DeHinden, Jim McLaren, and John Green. Uh, those are the men who saw that film for the very first time at uh, Al Diatli's house. And it was Green that investigated the, the, the tracks, too, right? Am I wrong on that? The tracks that they had to cover up with the cardboard yes. and bark and all that? Yes, he did see those. Yeah. Patterson, so Patty's, uh, the, the Bigfoot that's in the film, Patty's Footprints, Green was involved in the... Uh, in the uh, okay, and and the other thing is that I'm now that I'm talking about this, I'm recalling that there's a video online of Green in Bluff Creek. What what is that? Is that do you know the video yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah, that's awesome because what what Green endeavored to do, kind of on his own, is to go back to Bluff Creek, and I believe uh, the one man that I just mentioned, uh, Jim McLaren, it may have been him or is another acquaintance of his who is fairly tall. He went through a reconstruction of the footage where he tried to find exactly the same spot where uh, Roger Patterson took the film. He tried to direct his friend to stand in uh, the various places and walk the same path for the purpose of trying to find the approximate size of the figure in the Patterson film. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a... There's, you know, all sorts of comparisons that have been made, uh, cameras that he used, and things of that nature. But yes, that is a thing <laughs> that Green did. Is you know, not not totally unlike today's Finding Bigfoot, where they go back and do these loose recreations to get an approximate size. That's what Green was doing, but with a, a lot more in the way of careful measurements and right. uh, trying to to use some actual uh, scientific methodology to to make these comparisons. And that brings me to something I wanted to talk about real quick, which is that his it, the, it, the research style of John Green is so... Um, so, I guess, so, so his own, in that he is a newspaper man. His specialty seems to be talking to people, learning their story... He does do a lot of that analytical stuff. He does examine footprints. He's obviously the guy with the huge uh, footprint cast collection. You know, there's all those pictures of him with the footprint cast. But to me, he's always the interviewer. He's he's always, in my head, he is the guy that talked to people, got their story. And it's it's interesting, Green never saw a Bigfoot. To, to, to my knowledge. In fact, Green hasn't. I don't think DeHinden ever did. I don't know that Byrne claims to have. Uh, Krantz, I'm not sure about, which is interesting because these guys are the guys that are the figureheads. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Green's this very... just collecting stories. That's it's not the only thing he did, but that's one of his major contributions. And, he, and I don't even think he would argue that, especially if you look at you know his database of sighting reports online that you can find it's it's massive i mean it's comparable to like the bfro and then you realize this is just one man taking these reports this mm -hmm. isn't a giant you know uh group of of individuals spread out across the united states this is one man who was taking sighting reports from all over the world i think by the time they were done counting it was in the neighborhood of four thousand reports that he had uh, compiled right and you One put guy. your finger on something that is absolutely true about Green, and that is that he had a skill and a, just a natural talent to be able to put people at ease and to get their story. Mm -hmm. And not only in a sit-down fashion, like with the Albert Osman, for example, and so many of the other witnesses that he was able to talk to personally, but one thing that he really very intentionally and carefully did is he was able later in his life to take these long trips across North America with the express purpose of touching base with other people who are compiling reports. Yeah. And the point in talking to them and making this trip was to compare stories. You know, what stories do you have? Let me show you what I've got. And so his whole his whole uh, research approach was very much open and public let's share accounts, let's try to come to some sort of consensus together. And I think that continues to be one of his enduring qualities that the Bigfoot world would do well 
to appropriate more of is this idea that we're all trying to get to the bottom of this mystery together. I mean, he really seems like, um, as you read about him and, and learn his personality, or just listen to him speak when in the places where he's recorded, this is something that he is deeply interested in and is deeply interested in other people who are interested in it, mm -hmm. which is really kind of neat. And yeah. uh, I think that's part of what his legacy really will be, is sort of a sort of a, a shared enterprise idea to all of that. Um, following up after the, the Patterson-Gimlin, and I'll talk a little bit later about what his thoughts about that film are, because they're, they're uh, kind of important, I think. In 1968, he came out with his very first writing on the Bigfoot subject called On the Track of Sasquatch, and that led into 1969, where we get to, Seth, one of your favorite uh, sort of epitome moments of the whole Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's the Bossberg incident. Great, great. Yeah, in mid, this happened in mid-December, and the thing that I'm sure frustrated the heck out of John Green is that when this all went down, he was not able to get down there immediately. Mm -hmm. um, Green had a, a habit of when there was something fresh happening, especially in Bluff, Bluff Creek, um, he would get down there as soon as possible. But whatever the circumstances were, he couldn't do that in the case of Bossberg, so he had to wait for a little while, almost until the dust had literally settled. And the only tracks that he was able to really look at were ones that uh, somebody had uh, had the forethought enough to cover from the elements. So in his book, he's got like this... Uh, this vivid image of like an upside down box or some newspaper um, covering some of the the Bossberg tracks and so he goes out to look at those and the way that he sees those tracks for the first time is at the side of a new acquaintance of his who had also been attracted to Bossberg by the name of Grover Krantz hmm. and so you get this picture of them sort of making each other's acquaintance while they're looking at uh, this extremely strange track find. And this would become a rather important relationship in the Bigfoot world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well in just a few moments. But it was Green and Krantz. Um, their relationship was really unique in that in Krantz, Green found somebody that he had been searching for for years, which was a scientist, an actual bona fide scientist who would take this subject seriously. I mean, that's one thing that comes through all of Green's writing is this utter bewilderment as to why the scientific establishment would not have a greater interest in the topic. And finally, in Krantz, he finds someone who is in that world and is expressing an interest and is willing to get his hands dirty uh, doing so. So of all the things to happen coming out of Bossberg, I think that's by far the most significant because those two uh, would play off of each other really for the rest of their lives. Right. And the, 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 there's another case where there's all this infighting. And to say nothing of the fact that the cripple, the cripple foot track is probably one of the most famous individual Bigfoot casts you see. I mean, you constantly see that cripple foot track being brought up as kind of a, a major turning point. I mean, it's such an interesting track. And then the trackway itself went for, I mean, I want to say hundreds of yards. Am I wrong? I mean, it's like thousands. It was, it was, I want to say it was, it was like 1,200 individual tracks that they found. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I mean, it's a very long trackway. Now here is a really tantalizing bit of trivia, and it's it's almost conspiratorial. <laughs> okay. But um, I was listening to an interview that he did in 2007 and on the program Let's Talk Bigfoot, and at the very very end of that interview, he's asked about Bossberg, and his first com the first words out of his mouth was very dismissive in tone, and he said, "Oh." Bossberg, that whole thing was phony. 
Yeah. And then the line goes dead. <laughs> and they can't get him back on the line. So it's like, wow, well, wait a minute, you know? What, tell us more. But I haven't heard anything else about his true thoughts on, I on think, Bosberg. I, I think the reason he's so dismissive of Bosberg was because of, uh, oh my gosh, my my brain just went completely dead. What's his name? The the hoaxer. We've talked about him on the show before. Ivan Marks? Ivan Marks was living in Bosberg or around Bosberg around yeah. that same time, definitely had involvement in that case. I mean that's one of the reasons I like that case so much. It's it's so it's one of those puzzles you're trying to decipher whether or not there's a legitimacy to it or mm-hmm. not. I mean, yeah, Marx was involved and he was there, but and I think he even said that he had, you know, casts and had made footprints in that area, but that those casts if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, that that trackway actually went down into the river and then came back out on the other side. Um, yes. I mean, it's a very if it's a hoax, it was a great hoax. Not to say that Marx couldn't pull it off, but it's a very interesting hoax if it was a hoax. Yeah, and I've I've heard competing reports about Bosberg where there may have been more than one trackway, and one is exactly as you described, very sort of, you know, athletic quality to them, and and who could fake these type of things. And then there's another trackway that was essentially just by uh, the berm of a road. Mm-hmm. You know, where you could just somebody could hop out of a car that seems and a little uh, more, uh, walk in a straight line down the road and then hop back in the car and and go. That so seems a little more Marx style right there. It's probably yeah. his mother or whatever. Yeah. Was it that he stuck in the ape costume? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's his wife or his mom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I know I've I've referenced this before, but one of my favorite chapters in Apes Among Us is his his chapter on Ivan Marks mm-hmm. because yeah. he just makes this wonderful character sketch of a very uh, complex individual and he makes no bones about the fact he was there he was in the middle of all these things uh, you know you can you can uh, take what Marx says for whatever you think it's worth and you know he he does that in a very artful way I think yeah all right so 1970 is uh, the year he comes out with uh, the year of the Sasquatch, his next book, and it's also at right around this time that the University of Idaho takes an interest in Grover Krantz's writings and actually publishes Krantz's articles. It's the Northwest Anthropological Research Notes, a bona fide research journal that put Krantz's articles out there, and. Uh, Green was tremendously excited about this because he felt finally there's some legitimacy to this this search that we have been uh, undertaking. And it's also at this time that uh, he really starts to collate his stories that he has uh, accumulated. You might say the database begins around 1970 to really put these into uh, a discernible order. Um, That leads up, of course... To 1978, but uh, before that, just I want to say that in the early 70s, Green had reached a point where um, he sold his paper actually and was able to make a living off of selling his books and whatever sponsorship that he could get to continue the search. Um, he left a, the newspaper world behind, and th- the search for Bigfoot, you know, became truly became his life. And the estimates that I've seen on his books says that he's sold in the neighborhood of 200,000 copies, which is not New York Times bestseller, but that's a lot of Bigfoot books, too, by the same token. Yeah, think of the subject. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In 76, I talked about that briefly before, but he traveled extensively to meet as many other active researchers as possible, and his this is so great. I mean, think of this travelogue. He hits places like Falk, Arkansas, and he went to Lake Worth, Texas, and actually talked to Sally Ann Clark. Wow. Who wrote, who wrote the book? Right. You know, on the Lake Worth monster. So it's this sort of this Bigfoot road trip before Cliff Berrickman did it. Uh, <laughs> John Green was on the road talking to other researchers about their findings, and then very important 70s date is 78 
when uh, Sasquatch the Apes Among Us comes out in its first edition. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, Green and DeHinden finally reached the point where uh, they were driven apart uh, by a couple issues. One that we talked about before was Kill No Kill, and uh, John Green is clearly uh, pro-kill. We need a body. We have to have that to prove the existence of this creature, and science won't pay attention until then. Re uh, Rene de Hinden had reached a point, you know, in the late 70s, evidently, where he was pretty much uh, no kill, which is again kind of fascinating, considering his his personality. The other issue was how to handle information. Hmm. And as we said, one thing about Green is that he was completely open, let's share information, let's get as much detail as possible from as many places as possible to help us make a profile of this creature that we're after. Uh, De Hinden was completely the opposite. He was, sit on the information that you've got, keep it close to your vest, you know, don't, don't show your hand under any circumstances. And I, those two things really finally, and you know, I don't think it was a... From Green's perspective, it probably was a fairly amicable split. From De Hinden's perspective, uh, no, not so much. And he resorted to the sort of name-calling uh, for which he became infamous. Hmm. But, you know, finally, you know, what we get with uh, John Green is this picture of a very level-headed, uh, very rational, very sober thinker, but at the same time very personable, able to draw the stories out of people in a winsome sort of way. And the other thing uh, that makes Green so compelling is he's an excellent writer. Yeah. I mean, he's not a fancy writer by any stretch of the imagination, but he's an excellent writer. He knows how to make you turn the page, you know, just very skillful. He's just a, yeah. It's that it's a very straightforward retelling of events, retelling of what he's been told. It's it's not flowery. Um, his vocabulary doesn't seem to be huge. It's he writes like a newspaper man, and you know, like I said, as someone who's written for newspapers, when I read his writing, that's what I am drawn to the most. Is that as I'm reading it, I can I can identify that so easily. From from writing, I mean, I even know kind of the style that he's taking and the the word choice he's using, why his sentences are shorter than some people might be, and, and it's just this very. I I love the fact that he is so analytical, but at heart, I really feel like, and and I'm not saying this as a detraction, but I really feel like at heart he was a storyteller, and. This was the story he wanted to tell. He reached a point where he was done with his newspapers. He wanted to tell stories about Bigfoot. He he wanted to he I'm not saying he didn't want to uncover the truth about the mystery and he didn't want to, you know, prove the existence of the animal, but this was the the story he decided he wanted to spend the rest of his life telling. And I think the result is that you know, people love to hear the story the way he told it, mm -hmm. and uh, he's pulled many generations into a consideration of the search. No. Yeah. Real quick, I want to just give some some of John Green's actual takes on things because I just find it fascinating. The thing I love about him is that unlike some quote unquote researchers who just like to say, "Here's some interesting stories," and you consider them, um, and I'm not going to tell you what to believe about it, John Green was not afraid to have a take, and he just put it out there, and this is what I think about things. Um, one thing that is of extreme importance, really, is what he thought about the Patterson-Gimlin film, and at a certain point, he became very tired of talking about the stories swirling around the Patterson-Gimlin film, and, and what's Potter, what's uh, What's Roger Patterson's uh, personality like, and what was he after, and, and so on and so forth. And finally, he he says, um, you know, the movie does not depend on the story. He's like, look at the film. You tell me what you see there. Mm -hmm. And he uh, gets into, you know, he took the film to Disney, 
and talk to people there. And at the time, they said they could not duplicate what was in the film. And he talked to other folks in the movie business. And uh, they, too, said that this is not... We cannot do this. And, you know, of course, John Chambers' name comes up all the time. Um, but the investigation that Green did on that point and, and his final contention was you just have to look at the film and s say one thing that can be ruled out is this is the last thing this is is a guy in a gorilla costume from the Halloween store uh, in uh, Bluff Creek or, or in uh, that area in Yakima or, or some other location. Um, about Bob Titmus, you know, someone whose name has been dragged through the mud at this point uh, by a number of authors uh, but Green's opinion of Titmus was, he says, he was it. <laughs> uh, expert hunter, uh, he says, Willow Creek Museum, most of those, uh, the casts in there are Titmus finds. Uh, later in life, Bob Titmus actually bought a house from John Green, and they lived as uh, fairly close neighbors in Harrison Hot Springs. Huh. And uh, about the last 15 years of their life, so he was completely sold on Bob Titmus as being a uh, trustworthy and honest individual. And the same goes for uh, Bob Gimlin. Asked about Bob Gimlin, uh, John Green said he's absolutely salt of the earth, great guy, and what Bob Gimlin says happens is what, what happened. Hmm. Um, last thing really I want to say uh, about his, you know, his takes on things is that even though I think John Green today stands as the the quintessential flesh and blood uh, creature uh, purveyor, if you will, he was open-minded enough to write forwards for a wide range of Bigfoot books, many of which get very strange. And uh, he's he find this is the type of thing that he would write, which is just brilliant. I think he's uh, he's quoted. If Sasquatch have ever seen have ever been seen near UFOs, I would prefer to consider it a coincidence, or to assume that the occupants of the UFO were just looking at the Sasquatch, or vice versa. <laughs> so you know, it's just the type of uh, charming way of dealing with the subject. Um, I think kind of it stands as an emblem for the man. Uh, he was able to kind of build bridges where other people um, were not so successful and his writing I think stands as just the very classics when it comes to uh, Sasquatch literature yeah all right well you got it out of your system <laughs> yeah that was concise. Yeah. That was... Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to have fun editing that episode because mm -hmm. I know of so many sound clips from, from documentaries and stuff I can use in that. Yeah. It's, it's going to be an easy one. Cool. Uh, all right. Aggressive Encounters. Let's go. You didn't stop recording, right? Nope. Okay. It's rolling. All right. This is Sasswa, a podcast about Bigfoot. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Seth Breedlove. I'm joined tonight by my pal Mark Matsky. Hello there. And tonight we are talking about aggressive, homicidal Bigfoot encounters. And um, this was spurred on mostly by the fact that right now there is an influx of uh, recounting, uh, especially in the social networking world, of Stories that involve Bigfoot attacks and Bigfoot murders and Bigfoot kidnappings. And I think a lot of this stems from, and Mark, you can speak to this, I'm sure. But um, I think a lot of this stems from missing 411. You think I'm right? That certainly is a huge element here, I have to believe. Even though, you know, those books, as far as I know, I've not read them, but I've heard an awful lot of the... Uh, the stories contained in them, uh, 
through Coast to Coast AM and other sources. They never seem to go as far as saying it's Bigfoot, but I think we all know now the shadow behind the tree is right. supposed to be Bigfoot, right? Right. I think we're supposed to draw that. I don't know, actually. I don't, I don't know the conclusion. I've never understood the 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 deal with those books where it's this very vague kind of draw your own conclusions kind of thing. I, I get what he's doing, but I don't get what he's doing with mm-hmm. those books. But, um, okay, aggressive Bigfoot encounters. These have actually been a part of the lore going all the way back to the 1800s. There's violent Bigfoot uh, reports in newspapers dating back to the mid 1800s. I found some just in a brief uh, review before we started recording uh, from 1856. I want to say 1856. And uh, one of the stories I'm going to talk about is all the way back in the 18 or uh, yeah no 1900 actually. So so it's not like this is a new thing. People have been reporting violent encounters with Bigfoot. It's just there's there seems to be more of a slant toward this uh, homicidal murderer, whereas I think a lot of the older reports, to me anyway, read as fantastical retellings of, of a natural animal attack. You know, almost like if someone told the story of a grizzly bear attack in the 1900s or early 1900s or late 1800s, it would probably read similar, you know, the hideous hairy beast with giant claws attacking you. Um, I I don't, I, I think a lot of this, uh, and I don't want to go too much into this, but I think a lot of the, the violent, you know, Bigfoot monster reports um, stem from this weird need to put some sort of uh, boogeyman in our woods, right? So when we go out in the woods, we can have have some added adventure, you know. It's not crazy enough that there's an eight-foot-tall, hairy man-ape running around the woods. We also have to make him uh, kidnap our children and and murder our dog and do all sorts of awful things. Um, and you can speak to that if you want. But I, I did want to point out, I had talked before on a past episode about uh, a... a thesis that I had found online about wild men reports and in reading through that he had gone into the, the author of that and I don't have that paper in front of me but I'll try to dig it up for the show, show notes uh, the author of that thesis had talked about how uh, there were violent wild men encounters back when it was called the wood Wolves. and you know I mean it's it's a long there's a long history of this boogeyman of the woods kind of thing and I think the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle you know, there's. I'm sure there are. If if these things exist, if Bigfoot exists, there's probably been violent encounters before. And obviously, if it's a territorial animal, if it's an animal that has children, it's going to be defensive of its children, uh, of its young. If it's if it's trying to get food, it's probably going to snap something's neck if it needs it. Certainly, the Minerva monster case has a dead dog with a broken neck. And there's an interesting reason for that. And I'm hoping as we talk, Mark, through some of these reports and stuff, that we can maybe explore what the natural causes would be beyond just a um, psychotic killer, hairy killer. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I think there's a lot to what you're saying here in the early going about where these reports finally come from. Mm -hmm. One thing that you very quickly discover if you actually start to look for reports of Bigfoot killing people is that there's some amazingly tantalizing stories that are out there, none of which can be substantiated. Right. That becomes an all too familiar refrain is that you get some report of a camping party and uh, police or rangers discover this and it's just a terrible scene and, you know, the authorities know about this, but then there's no police report whatsoever. There's nothing in the public record that this happened. There's no family members saying, Bigfoot killed my son. You know, there's nothing. Perfect. And so it, it, it borders on well, urban legend. Exactly. Quite frankly. This, this is a really, i got to jump in here because this is a great segue for me to bring up my first report. 
which which I found on BigfootEncounters.com, where I tend to turn to for a lot of these reports. Um, and you can go back to whatever your thought was there, but as long as you're talking about uh, killing campers, I found a report called, uh, uh, or no, actually, this is Inyo County, Bishop, California, mid to late 1970s is what the report is entitled. So it's already extremely vague. But then it starts out, uh, and this was written by a man, uh, Rich G- Grumley, who is in the California Bigfoot Organization from 35 to 2000. He wrote, in 1980 to 81, the year I was born, I was working as a security guard on a high-tension tower project here in California. I met a man who was a cat skinner operating a bulldozer, leveling off the pads, blah, blah, blah. During the conversation, I mentioned Bigfoot, and he told me that in the mid to late 1970s, he was doing a little poaching with the forestry official's permission in a locked and gated area near Bishop, California. They had given him a key so he could get in any time he wanted. This particular time, the gate was still locked. He let himself in with, it, with his four-wheel pickup to the area known as Four Points. He drove over a hill, and there, to his surprise, were Department of the Interior Vehicles and Bureau of Land Management men all in their Smokey the Bear outfits with guns, searching a campground, the hills, mountains, roads, etc. They grabbed this hunter, took his deer rifle away from him, and questioned him for seven, seven to eight hours as to what he was doing there. Local forestry officials identified him as a trusted friend. He was let go, but told to never come back. He had determined during his interrogation that the reason the BLM and Department of Interior were there in force was that a Bigfoot creature had gone through there the day before and had torn up the campground, had turned over a large trash container that no man can even begin to move. And then just just at the end of that sentence, it adds, and had killed several people. Um, over the years, the story was passed through several people, in fact, quite a few Bigfoot researchers, but no one was able to come up with one single clue. Uh, I found it very interesting. Um, it goes on to say that some eventually a, a former policeman who said that he was in the Bishop Police Force in the mid to late 1970s confirmed it. But um, that's hearsay as well. And the whole story, <laughs> the whole story seems so far-fetched and and of, of course this is where the you know the the interesting thing and i hate to keep going back to the bigfoot conspiracy stuff because i i really d- have no opinion one way or the other hard on it i i have a real hard time accepting it but i'm not completely discounting it automatically either um i don't yeah i'm not going any further into it but anyway i think this is a good uh, uh, sort of example of how this kind of thing can come around this seems like a really cool story right so you read it and you're like, but how would, I mean, the the logical question is how would these people, if there's several people dead, how would this word of this have not gotten out, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the only reason to make that happen is if someone had been hushed up. Here comes the Department of Forestry hushing up the death of several campers. And automatically we have a very romanticized um, conspiracy theory covering up a... And it's a great story, right? Because you've got this wrecked camp and you've got dead people all over the place and somewhere in the woods a Bigfoot screaming and he's holding someone's chopped off arm in a hand and wavering it over his head like a tomahawk. I mean, it's it's a fantastic story, but it's completely unverifiable. It's, it's <laughs> really similar to uh, the UFO stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's a very similar story, and the details of this... I think you will appreciate. Um, this comes out of the 1970s in Bend, Oregon. Uh, let's see. Based on a phone call from someone in the TV industry, so right away you're like, okay, who relayed details of the interview conducted with an unnamed state trooper. As summarized, the policeman commented on four hunters being killed in the Bend area. The rifle had been found twisted out of shape. There's a report from the Forest Service of a Sasquatch footprint of large size that had been found in a lava bed near Bend, where lava had been fresh at the time. The Forest Service people said also that a large-breasted female Sasquatch had been seen in the Bend area. So, you know, again, where's the police report? Were four men hunting with a single rifle? Uh, How could Bigfoot (laughs) stroll through fresh lava? Where was that? Oregon's last... (laughs) Eruption was in 1860, but it's just stuff like that, you know, that 
<laughs> it has all the hallmarks of these uh, fantastic stories, but in the end, it just goes nowhere. It's a great story, though. I mean, it is. It is. Get it over it. As long as we're going to talk about that, you know, I I wanted to talk. We, we've mentioned it before, but the um, Ape Canyon incident could definitely be considered an, an aggressive encounter. Mm -hmm. There's there's aspects to the Ape Canyon story that, that have precedent, or not precedent, but that they're definitely repeated uh, actions and characteristics of Bigfoots that we see in other reports. Some, not all, but some. The the throwing of rocks. Th there's and and an interesting aspect to that story as well as the fact that one of the apes was supposedly killed. So there again, you know, we can come across kind of a something that might point to a known creature, which is kind of a they might have sensed some sort of territorial territorial dispute with these miners. Um, but anyway, that is all to say that I found these articles out of the Sixes mining camp. D did you ever read these? They're in Chad Armand's book, the one we always reference. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, I found this one. I want to talk about it real quick. This is in the Sixes mining district in um, the, the stories ran in Oregon. This one ran in the Lane County Leader in April 7th, 1904. But if you read, uh, Mark and I reference this book a lot. Chad Armand's book, Historical Bigfoot, uh, basically collections of newspaper articles. This one is called Six's Wild Man Again Visits the Cabin of Miners and Frightens Prospectors. Now, the, the opening of this is basically just about the men constantly seeing this uh, these, these figures. I think this only references one figure constantly making noise and, and scaring people. So I'm going to jump a little ways down through the article or we'll be here all night because this is a long one. But it says, um, uh, the first appearance appear, appeared on Thompson Flat. W.M. Ward and a young man by the name of Burleson were sitting by the fire of their cabin one night when Burleson, when they heard something walking around the cabin which resembled a man walking, and when it came to the corner of the cabin, it took hold of the corner and gave the building a vigorous shake and kept up a frightful noise all the time, the same noise that has so many times warmed the venturesome miners of the approach of the hairy man and caused them to flee in abject fear. Mr. Ward walked to the cabin door and could see the monster plainly as it walked away and took a shot at it with his rifle. But the bullet went wild of its mark. The last appearance of the animal was at the Harrison cabin only a few days ago. Mr. Ward was at the Harrison cabin this time and again figured in the excitement. About five o'clock in the morning, the wild man gave the door of the cabin a, vis a vigorous shaking which aroused Ward and one of the Harrison boys who took their guns and started in to do the intruder. Ward fired at the man, and he answered by sending a four-pound rock at Ward's head, but his aim was a little too high. He then disappeared in the brush. Uh, it goes on to say that, that they vowed, the miners vowed to have their, their vengeance on this on this creature. But I love this story because it, it reminds me of Ape Canyon. It, it also reminds me of some of the Area X uh, North American Wood Ape Conservancy encounters uh, in the Wachita Mountains. Um, and that mention of shaking uh, shaking the cabin this is repeated a lot this is one of those things like you and I did the episode where we talked about repeated characteristics this is this is something that I've seen in many reports uh, a, an animal putting a hand or smacking the side of a house shaking uh, there's a lot of reports of sh shaking not just cars but mobile homes and trailers and RVs and and cabins so I, but I think this is a really cool story because it reminds me of Ape Canyon. It's 1904, and it's in this one area that has repeated reports. This isn't, this is a there. There's a whole series of articles. Uh, I'd say six or seven in this one book alone. And if there's six or seven in this book, then I'm sure there's more out there. The thing that's great about that story that you read is that it does combine a number of different forms of. Bigfoot aggression, right? You know, you have the the violent behavior towards a structure, um, and there's a whole body of report uh, that has been taken about you know Bigfoot, like you said, uh, slapping the side of a house or shaking it or, or running into it, what have you. The rock throwing as well is another stream of uh, aggressive behavior. So it. From a rather early perspective, it it touches on behaviors that um, you know clearly have 
been set into a pattern at this mm -hmm. point. And yeah. there's there's also, I mean, you could just keep going and going with like this uh, miner or prospector. It's like a subgenre of <laughs> especially old Bigfoot reports. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm looking at a whole bunch of those. You know, one, uh, this was um, in the Grizzly Lakes area. There, There's uh, 17 Grizzly Lakes that exist. Wow. in the six western U.S. states, so which one it is is anyone's guess. Right. But from the 1860s, there's a story of uh, three brothers mining copper, one sibling vanishes while wintering alone in the cabin, the second disappears the next year, leaving a journal entry that describes strange hairy monsters prowling outside, and the lone survivor's fate is unrecorded. But, you know, it, it's sort of a... Like I said, it, it's a whole subgroup of these, um, you know, the great, the adventure of the, the Pacific Northwest and striking out on your own and being uh, this, you know, prospector type or uh, trying to find your fortune out there. It seems like part of that adventure for some people includes, um, you know, uh, these stories about the danger that you encounter when you go out there. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, from sort of a folkloric perspective, that might be part of what's at the root of this. Is, is there's you know cautionary tales about you know you can go out there and try to find you know, your uh, vein of gold or whatever it is you're looking for, but you're doing so at great personal risk. There may even be you know uh, violent ape men out there who are waiting sure. to uh, waiting to attack. Yeah, and and there's reports similar to this one. Even here in Ohio, we have the uh, uh, a report I talk about quite often, which is the Coshocton ape. I mean, um, the, one of those newspaper articles that talks about the Coshocton ape uh, mentions four or five men wandering around in the dark under a tree, armed, looking for this ape that's been reported. And the ape leaps down out of the tree and, and attacks them and then runs off. Um there's there there definitely is a history of these sort of things, and uh, you know I keep mentioning the the romanticized uh, I don't think romanticized I, I guess exaggerated would probably be a better word exaggerated sort of horrific view of big Bigfoot which is it's big right now um, mm -hmm. I've seen people posting online where they're they're literally keeping their children from going camping they're they're they don't believe, you know, they should be out in the woods. Kids should be out in the woods um, because they might get mauled or eaten by a Bigfoot, kidnapped and run off by a Bigfoot. Um, it's stupid for people to be out in the woods looking for Bigfoot because he'll most likely murder you, that kind of thing. Wow. Yeah, I mean, but but there is there is a history. Like I said, there is a history certainly of, of violent encounters. I mean, and some of them do seem, you know, legitimate um it's it's interesting to try to draw a line between the the violent bigfoot you know what were t quote unquote violent bigfoot encounters and then bigfoot encounters that involve some sort of attack on livestock or pets um because you know animals uh especially predatory animals don't get along well with other animals <laughs> of of mm -hmm. different species traditionally i mean that's that's how that's how things work in nature. So, but what's weird with Bigfoots is it isn't just that they're out there. You know, I, I find the odd, you know, dog killing or, or chicken killing. I don't find that that strange. It's it's just an animal. But what is odd is things like um, I just read a report today where a guy was talking about how he had found uh, chickens from his had been had been going missing from his his. Uh, his coop, and he he found them in the woods behind his house, and they'd actually been plucked of all their uh, of all their feathers, and then laid in a row. And he had seen a Bigfoot at some point before this, so he drew the you know he drew that parallel. Well, obviously this was a Bigfoot that did this. Um, there's there's things like uh, the animal deaths down in Bolivar where I grew up, which the farmers in the woods back there did attribute some of those to. To Bigfoots, um, where those deer were found ripped in half, um, stuffed up in trees. There were deer found with the hides ripped off. Um, very 
odd. It doesn't. It almost doesn't seem like just an animal killing, right? Because because some of the stuff seems like this weird brutality involved. But is it, or is it just an animal? You know, they maybe they found some unique way of eating this de- <laughs> of eating this deer. You know, I don't know that kind of stuff because I'm not quite intelligent enough. Um, a friend of mine from Facebook messaged me that he was hunting down in Coshocton back in the day, and he came into a clearing and found um, de- um, ducks hanging by their necks in a clearing uh, from trees. And literally their heads were tied in, their, their necks were tied into a knot, and they were hanging from trees. And, and he thought that was an, an unusual... You know, of, of course, when, you know, we jump to Bigfoot, but there's obviously hunters out there who would do that. I mean, maybe crazy, sociopathic, psychopathic yeah. hunters. Regardless, that's a place I would want to leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the den of dead ducks, you mean? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah, but it's interesting. It's, it's, it's interesting to try to figure out, you know, like, what are you classifying as a violent or aggressive Bigfoot encounter, you know. Right. Obviously, obviously there there are stories in native folklore of 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 Sasquatch stealing children and running off into the night with them. It, does that have a basis in reality? I think that's an important distinction because, you know, on one hand you have these grisly death <laughs> reports, you know, and the Entire campground, you know, is blood red, and the you've got the authorities searching and and making anonymous claims about that, all of which is un, unsubstantiated completely. Mm-hmm. But then on the other hand, you have an entire, uh, you know, a huge group of reports from eyewitnesses who have said something grabbed me through my car window. Yeah, and uh, I've got the scratches to prove it. And we took pictures and things like that. And I, some of those seem awfully arbitrary, you know, just strangely violent. Like, what, what would possess a creature like that to just, you know, grab somebody by the head and bash them against the interior of their car or things like that? Uh, and, uh, can but I that, uh, cut in here real quick? Yeah. As long as you're talking about cars, we can go right back to whatever you're talking about. I wanted to talk about the Monroe Monster real quick. This is one of my favorite Bigfoot encounter yeah. reports. Yes. Monroe Monster. This is uh, August 18th, 1965. Um, this is. I'm just reading real quick from a newspaper article here. There was a, a mother and her daughter were in a car. Um, they said the hunt for the hairy monster of Monroe was sparked by a report from 17-year-old Christine Van Acker and her mother, Mrs. George Owens. They said the creature accosted them as they drove through the area last weekend. I screamed, and Christine screamed, said Mrs. Owens. I looked over at my daughter, and there was this huge hairy hand on top of her head. Christine, sporting a beaut of a black eye, said the hairy thing clung to the car with one hand and to her hair with the other before loping away through the woods. Another young girl showed red marks on her arm as proof the monster dragged her away. Um, the Monroe monster is a really fascinating series of events uh, in that there are it's documented like crazy. I mean, there's all sorts of newspaper articles about it. But one thing that's that's kind of funny about it is in the end it did seem to be, even though there were reports after uh, this article, there was a lie detector test that proved that the the man who actually grabbed the girl in in a car was a a man in a uh uh I'm trying to find where it says it was a man in an ape suit I believe he took a polygraph <laughs> test uh the story of the 7 foot tall monster was dismissed by state police police after a ho- as a hoax after a teenager and her mother f- uh flunked a polygraph test Monday the ladies however are sticking to their stories that's what it was okay but later on, that so so I completely screwed that up. So they failed a lie detector test, so the police just automatically assumed that they had been lying. But later on, a guy in a suit was found. But what's interesting is after the, after that, there were continued sightings in that same area. So it's this like back and forth story. But anyway, I thought that that case kind of fit in very well here because she's in her car and something reaches into the car and starts smacking her in the yeah. head, apparently, with a hairy arm. Yeah. And you one of the most famous the ones, you've probably heard this before, this was from November 1969, 
A guy named uh, Charles Buchanan was sleeping in the rear bed of his pickup truck at Lake Worth, Texas. Mm -hmm. And he claimed that he all of a sudden was being lifted up in the air, sleeping bag and all. You know, and another Osman was in progress. And the creature that was lifting him was a cross between a human being and a gorilla or an ape. Buchanan uh, very resourcefully grabbed a bag of leftover fried chicken he had back there <laughs> with him and stuck it in the creature's face, which evidently was the right thing to do because the creature took off happily with the, the bag of food and left Buchanan to wonder, you know, what had happened there. Wow. Yeah. And so there's, there's story after story like this. And one that I think would be sort of a transition point back to where we were talking before is uh, comes out of uh, West Virginia in 1999 um, in uh, McDonald, McDowell County, West Virginia. A uh, man resp responded to a noise from his yard, met a tall black creature which grabbed him and threw him down like a limp rag. Upon recovering, he found four of his dogs dead and the fifth injured. So dogs and Bigfoot don't really seem to mix too well. Not at all. And There's I'm not that. sure what that's about, um, except that you know, dogs would be uh, fairly well alerted to their presence. And uh, for creatures that sort of survive on stealth, uh, there may be something about a dog that infuriates them, you know, mm -hmm. that they're able to uh, call them out, so to speak. Yeah, this is one of those, again, calling back to the Minerva monster, dead dog. Um, guard dog, uh, if, if, if a Bigfoot wants to go where it wants to go without anyone being alerted to their presence, a dog is going to be a problem. And if, uh, if it's an intelligent primate, maybe it just says, well, I'll take out the dog. Not have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So, it is interesting, but... With the final thoughts, Mark, I hate to I hate to bring this to a close, but final thoughts on aggressive Bigfoot encounters. I think, as we've said, there are some distinctions that we can properly make. It seems to me that when you get into the realm of homicidal Bigfoot, the problem there is this simply the lack of substantial evidence to link Bigfoot to deaths that occur out in nature. I mean, certainly nobody's saying those don't happen. Mm -hmm. that people do die when they go out there. But was it caused by Bigfoot or another wild animal? Um, it seems to me that so often, almost all the time, when you have a Bigfoot killed people story, there's nothing to back that up. And I used the phrase earlier, urban legend. It, it just smacks of urban legend spinning. Mm -hmm. um, however, then you have cases where people did live to tell the tale, and that requires a little more inspection, I think. And there's lots to go on. As we've said, we're just scratching the surface as far as being assaulted by Bigfoot reports go. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I think there's some really legitimate questions about how Bigfoot responds to animals and as... Is referred so often to as an apex predator. Well, by definition, a predator is going to find something to predate mm -hmm. and eat to survive. And I don't think you can really chalk that up to violence uh, any more than you can chalk it up to us eating stuff right. uh, from the natural world. Um, there's also then the rock throwing and the the uh, sort of violent behavior towards the the structures themselves. Um, than uh, habitations where we live. All of which is to say that certainly I do believe there's folkloric elements to this that goes back to Native American uh, stories that were handed down through oral tradition of kidnapping creatures and, and you know all that serves to, to scare people and keep them from wandering away from places where they should be. I'm not saying that's the only reason why there's scary Bigfoot stories, but I do think there's an element of it to that, you know, deep in our psyche somewhere. Sure, sure. And on the other end of the spectrum, if there are, you know, if there are these creatures out there in our woods and they are a combination of 
simply primate, and if there's any humanity to them whatsoever, then it stands to reason that there's going to be good big feet or big foot, mm -hmm. and there's going to be ones that are you know, out to do damage just because that is their personality, their nature. And I think it would be just mistaken to say that should these creatures be real, that they're all exactly the same and they behave ex precisely the same way under the different sets of circumstances. I don't think it's a stretch to say you could get a Bigfoot that just has a chip on his shoulder or, you know, has, enjoys being brutal mm -hmm. just as well as you could get ones that are uh, gentle and, and kind and sort of welcome your presence in the woods as long as you don't do anything ridiculous. All right, cease recording. Save project. All right.